I'm excited to invite up Toby Schoenfeld to be our darshanit today. But as I was thinking just now about my introduction, I realized she being a bioethicist and person of always interesting conversation, um, of which I uh, always have an opportunity here at Shul and outside of Shul, I realized that what I was going to say has a fundamental flaw to my argument, which is I was going to say that uh, when there is not B'nai Mitzvah, we like to invite people from the congregation to share their voices, which is true. But fundamental to that idea is the premise that the B'nai Mitzvah family actually want to hear from the clergy. <laughs> and I think that's the flaw of that logic <laughs> because I am confident that what Toby will share both this week and also she's going to speak on a different topic next week or what Lila Katz spoke about over Thanksgiving like is worthy of, um, of the largest crowds possible. So I realized the flaw in my logic, which is that B'nai Mitzvah wants to hear from me when I am far less interesting than you. Um, so I'm excited uh, for you to be our teacher, that Toby and James are regulars. If you need to know, they sit on my right side, <laughs> halfway back, um, pretty much each week. Uh, that is their spot where they can uh, have a great discourse about the air conditioning and the sound <laughs> on that part of it. So without further ado, here's Toby. <laughs> uh, Shabbat Shalom, thank you for that. I am available for bi mitzvahs, for weddings, for ulfrof, so just let me know. Um, but seriously, thank you to Rabbi Harris, to Rabbi Megdal for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some words with you today, and to my good friend, Dr. Cindy Geppert, theologian who, uh, with whom I've had wonderful conversations about this topic in particular, and some of whose text I'm gonna use today. So several months ago, a colleague asked me to speak to his leadership team uh, about ethical leadership. It's not unusual. What is unusual is the article he provided to me as his inspiration. This piece appeared in the Journal of Business Ethics in 1993, uh, and its central thesis is that success itself creates ethics failures. The authors argue that first, success breeds complacency, so leaders take their eye off the prize. Second, that leaders in successful environments get problematic, privileged access to information, that leaders have access to unrestricted resources. Clearly, these authors were not in the government, because, mm. um, And success tempts leaders into thinking they can uniquely manipulate outcomes. So what's the shorthand? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I don't actually agree with these authors, I think information is simply input, and it's what you do with it that matters, for example. But it's not their thesis that really took me aback. What took me aback was the proof text of their thesis, the story of King David. And here's how they tell it. The story of David and Bathsheba is familiar in a variety of traditions. Accounts of King David's life are contained in both the Old Testament and the Torah. Remember, this is journal of business ethics. So. These accounts describe a leader with a humble past, a dramatic and rapid rise to power, strong organizational skills, a charismatic personality, an eclectic approach to problem solving, a strategic vision for his people, and, wait for it, a man of high moral character. In his day, he was a man who had it all. I'm still quoting. He had power, influence, wealth, physical comforts, loyal servants, a strong army, and a growing and prosperous country. He was a king. Yet despite both the quality of his life and his moral character, King David was a leader who got caught up in a downward spiral of unethical decisions that had grave consequences for both his personal life and the organization that he was called on to lead and protect. David's failings as a leader were dramatic, even by today's standards, 1993, and in, think about 1993, um, and included an affair, the corruption of other leaders, 
deception, drunkenness, murder, the loss of innocent lives, and a we-beat-the-system attitude when he thought he had managed to cover up his crimes. The good, bright, successful, popular, visionary King David was nearly destroyed because he could not control his desire to have something that he knew it was wrong for him to have, Bathsheba. End quote. The allegation here is that but for the dalliance with Bathsheba and, you know, having her husband killed, yada, yada, David's leadership would have been unblemished. This was his fall from grace, the one bad act that set him careening downward off the pedestal of leadership. The problem with pedestals is that they are almost always artificially inflated. Rarely are people paragons of virtue. I do values and virtue for a living, so I know from whence I speak. If you dig into the failures of ethical leadership, what you actually see is that the majority of them were the predictable outcome of something I'll call ethical erosion. Careful attention to the warning signs in and around us and openness to a continual cycle of feedback can help to keep this erosion at bay. A word about erosion. The concept of land erosion is much in the news of late, although, and though it takes place over long spans of geographic time, its eventual effect is devastating. Even though it's happening in plain sight, it's often ignored and nothing done to try and stop or reverse it until it's too late. And sometimes when we try to stop it, we focus on the wrong thing. Like with the butterfly effect, where the flapping of butterflies' wings in one area is the catalyst to a much larger change. So efforts at then holding back the storm are both too little and too late. The same is true for morality. Ethical erosion affects the moral ecology of an environment, even when people are unaware of specific actions. I could give many, many examples of this, but the one that struck me as I was preparing this was the notion that African-American patients are rightly suspicious of the medical establishment, even if they've never heard of J. Marion Sims or the US Public Health Service syphilis study, right? Which sometimes you know is Tuskegee. And if you're curious about either of those two, come talk to me at Kiddish. Rabbi David Wolpe reminds us that we can see the elements that erode David's leadership even before he is anointed. God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse to find a new king. And when he tells God he's worried that Saul will kill him, what does God do? He tells him to lie. Tell him you're there to make a sacrifice to the Lord. We'll put aside for a minute why God made Samuel do his dirty work in the first place, right? But really, the best and omnipotent God can say is lie? Seems like a bit of strategy or ingenuity could have identified an alternative plan, but nope. We'll use it to our advantage, but lie. This is not a particularly morally auspicious start to David's kingship. And remember our butterfly effect. Small actions around us can have larger consequences down the line. The first time we hear David speak is during the encounter with Goliath. Everybody remembers the part about the slingshot, right? What few remember is what he says. I'll remind you, he says, what will be done for the one who kills that Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? Who is that uncircumcised Philistine that he dares defy the ranks of the living God? To paraphrase, what will you give me if I take down the loudmouth over there? We know that the first words a person speaks in the Bible are important. So what does it say that David's first words are, what's in it for me? He is self-assured and confident and narcissistic. Now, maybe this is just boys being boys, right? A bit of showing off. But remember, when we say it's just boys being boys, we're giving them a pass at acceptable behavior because we acknowledge that what they're doing is at the very least suboptimal. That in other times and other places, we would not accept their behavior, right? If that's true, then David here isn't being kingly, he's being every man. Remember that, this is gonna be important later. Generally speaking, ethical erosion is the result of conflicting demands or a conflict of interest and obligations between organizational goals and pressure and individual principles and standards that are irreconcilable. Almost always there are repeated attempts to try and resolve the tensions, but when those efforts fail, especially if one's ethical reserve is already depleted by multiple pressures, they erode ethical defenses. 
Erosion is far more likely to occur in climates where bending the rules, making exceptions, and crossing lines are not only rewarded in various ways, but also where leadership communicates a rationalization of the ethical drifts that normalize the shifts. Erosion is more likely when ethical actions are taken in order to win praise and avoid blame in all of its organizational forms. A higher performance rating, being your supervisor's favorite, fitting in with a team, being made king. Remember the part of David's story when he moves the Ark to Jerusalem? In celebration that night, he, well, goes to the rave. He, you know, parties hardy. His wife, Michal, reprimands him, and his response back to her is snarky. A dramatic reading. Michal, didn't the king of Israel do himself honor today, exposing himself today in the sight of his maid, the maidservants of his subjects, as one of the riffraff might expose himself? David, it was before God who chose me instead of your father and all his family and appointed me ruler over Israel, God's people. I will dance before God and dishonor myself even more and be low in my own esteem, but among the maidservants that you speak of, I will be honored. End scene. <laughs> What's the result? David gets a divine dynasty and Michal remains barren. Her punishment is to die childless. Really, God? Now, the topic of the women in David's life is way too much to discuss here, but this example of where suboptimal behavior either is rewarded or at least has no negative effect, depending on what you take the bad action to be here, is exactly the kind of ethical erosion that leads to the big bad that everybody talks about. It is not an isolated occurrence. It is not, but for this terrible influence, Instead, it's steady, gradual erosion of actions and decisions over time. Each ethical lapse weakens the ethical defenses, making it easier next time not only to make a bad decision, but also to rationalize it as a good one. It's easy to scapegoat bad apples as the cause of ethical erosion and failures, and bad apples certainly need to be held accountable. Yet all of us are at risk for unethical behavior. We've all made poor decisions and taken actions that are suboptimal, cut corners, or taken the path of least resistance. Yet we are much more likely to behave unethically if we do not acknowledge that we are all at risk. Recognizing your ethical vulnerabilities as professionals and as human beings can help leaders take proactive, preventive actions to avoid ethical situations that potentially compromise core values. Now note that I'm not saying we can avoid making bad decisions. I don't think we can, at least not as humans. We're fallible, we get it wrong sometimes. But how we respond to those errors is our opportunity to course correct, to halt erosion in its tracks. Suppose that after slaying Goliath, David's sitting around the fire with the boys, they're reflecting on the day, and he says, you know guys, I'm glad it worked, but man, I was scared. Imposter syndrome is real. I mean, I knew I was good with this slingshot, but really, am I that good? I wish I had stopped to think for a minute. I mean, what if I had missed? Demonstrations of humility and vulnerability in an after action report can have the same effect as careful proactive strategy. It tells the listeners that a continuous self-improvement is always possible and laudable. Listen to that still small voice that tells you that something isn't right. Or what if David had responded to Michal's taunt by saying, you know, you're right. I totally got caught up in the excitement and I did some things I probably should not have. I will try to be better next time. True leaders surround themselves with people who speak truth to power and are really open to learning from them. And what about the big bad? What about the episode with Bathsheba? David laid with another man's wife, not ideal, although not unheard of in biblical times. We'll talk about laying with and weddings and marriages and divorces and stuff next week. So the real moral failure in this story, we might say, starts with David trying to trick Uriah into sleeping with his own wife so they could pass off uh, Bathsheba's pregnancy as the result of this coupling. 
By the way, in case anyone wants to know where all these romance writers get their text, <laughs> it's all throughout the Bible. I mean, you don't have to make any of this stuff up, right? So when that doesn't work, David gets Uriah drunk and tries to get him to sleep with his wife so they can pass off, et cetera, et cetera, see above, right? When that doesn't work, he has him killed and brings Bathsheba to the palace as his wife. Seriously, David, this is the guy God chose to lead a dynasty? Fast forward to the after action report. God sends the prophet Nathan with a parable of a rich shepherd who slays the poor shepherd's only little lamb to feed a traveler. When David is incensed and passes judgment, only then does Nathan reveal that he is the rich shepherd who unjustly took Uriah's life and wife. God's punishment is the reassignment of his wives, again, we'll talk next week, and death of the child he conceived with Bathsheba. When David repents, God spares David's life, but the other sanctions hold. I always wonder what would have happened if Uriah had slept with his wife and David had won again. This would be yet another moral failure he got away with, a bad action that didn't result in bad consequences that makes it easier to slide down that slippery slope. And in fact, that's part of what happened here. He had never had bad consequences from his previous actions, so killing Uriah didn't even give him a moment's pause. It was just the next step for him. So why in the world is this guy our king? Why is the Messiah destined to come from this line? Now this is a longer argument than I can make today, but I believe it is actually this event his affair with Bathsheba, that helps to define him. It is not that he was a perfect leader. In fact, quite the opposite. He's flawed. He's courageous, skillful, articulate, passionate, and fallible. He gets it wrong. He gets it really wrong. And he repents. And he learns. And he listens. And he asks to start over again. Consider some of the words from Psalm 51, which I've uh, excerpted from here. Have mercy upon me, O God, as befits your faithfulness. In keeping with your abundant compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly of my iniquity and purify me of sin, for I recognize my transgressions and am ever conscious of my sin. Against you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are just in your sentence and right in your judgment. O Lord, open my lips and let my mouth declare your praise. You do not want me to bring sacrifices. You do not desire burnt offerings. True sacrifice to God is a contrite spirit. God, you will not despise a contrite and crushed heart. David gets it wrong, and he repents, and he learns. I think the reason God favors David is not because of how kingly he is, but because of how kingly he is not. Remember earlier when I said that David is every man? It is that characteristic, when combined with his leadership traits, that make him worthy of a dynasty. His ability to admit his vulnerability and to demonstrate time and again both his failures and his willingness to be better is why God provides him with grace. So what does that mean for us? It means that we can't expect to get it right every time. If you ask my staff, in my case, not even most of the time. Yet when we, it's what we do with those failures, with the mistakes, that can prevent ethical erosion from spreading. Develop habits of ethical reflection that sharpen your awareness of a drift in actions and decisions. Combine that with real commitment to core values for both yourself and your broader organization and mission. Set regular points for review of especially difficult decisions, complex projects, controversial actions, or uncharacteristic behaviors that can help you to detect drift when it first happens and course correct. Be resolute and steadfast in implementing and owning a decision or action balance, flexibility, and commitment, confidence, and humility. At the end of the day, remember that it all boils down to this. Do justice, love goodness, and walk modestly with your God. Then will your name achieve wisdom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat.